Well, welcome everyone as you're coming in and joining us. Uh, we will be doing introductions here real soon. Uh, this is Silica Part 2, uh, and this is a program with the National Tile Contractors Association, IQ Power Tools, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. Um, we'll do some introductions here real soon. Today, what we're going to be talking about is uh, OSHA uh, at, at, and the respirable uh, airborne silica regulation and how it pertains to you. And by you, I mean primarily contractors, installers, uh, people who are working with uh, uh, respirable airborne silica in their daily work lives. And we want you to understand this regulation, you to understand uh, how silica, airborne silica that you breathe in impacts your health, your safety, your life, your work life, your business, all of these things, and what you can do to uh, meet the regulation, to comply with it, and to protect yourself. So that's what we're talking about today. And uh, uh, in just a minute, we'll get going with the introductions. And I want to go back to Sarah and ask her again, where are we streaming live, Sarah? We are going live through Zoom and Facebook, both of the IQ page and the NTCA pages. And we are going live on Instagram. So three different places to contact us and watch this content. And then as soon as we're done with this, it will be saved and put up on YouTube for both our channels and the NTCA pages. So you will be able to have access to this information even after this recording. That's wonderful. So we are out all over broadcasting and we're starting here in just less than a minute. We'll get started with our introductions. We have a uh, panel from across the country. I'll be introducing all of them to you soon. And as you come in, you might notice that you are muted and you probably cannot unmute if I understand that correctly, Sarah. Correct. Panelists are the only people that can actually talk. But attendees, please ask your questions via the chat. And same thing with all the forums that we're on. If you have a question and you're on Instagram or Facebook, type it in and we'll interrupt these guys and get that question answered for you guys. OK, great. So once again, uh, today is December 22nd, 2020. And this is an NTCA live webinar in our NTCA webinar series. And I'm Mark Heinlein. I'm the training director for the Ta National Tile Contractors Association, or the NTCA. And we are here with this webinar called uh, Silica Part 2. And this is a discussion of respirable airborne silica and how it pertains to contractors, installers, and people who work with uh, tile and related setting materials in the tile industry. And I'm joined today by uh, Sarah Hurtado. Sarah, can you tell us uh, what your role is? Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Hurtado, like Mark said, and I am the marketing manager here at IQ. So I handle productions such as this and um, our social media and things like that and really engaging with our customers. And to my left, I guess, is our president, Paul Guth. Hi Paul, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm Paul Guth. I'm the president of IQ Power Tools. And just, you know, a brief uh, history about IQ Power Tools is we were contractors. I was a general contractor, a mason by trade. So we came out of the trades and developed a lot of these tools that we sell today that are uh, cutting tools with integrated dust collection. So we kind of grew up out of the industry, understanding the regulations, trying to comply to the regulation. And then ultimately, we started building tools to meet the, help us meet those regulations uh, from a silica regulation standpoint. So um, that's kind of our take. We're a manufacturer, but we also have a background uh, with uh, end users. So we're here based in Southern California, and we're uh, really, uh, it, it pleases us greatly to participate in these types of programs to bring up the awareness of the dangers of silica and the exposures of silicosis. So. Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks for help us, uh, helping us host this program today. Uh, in my opinion, you are an industry expert uh, on many things, silica including them. Thank you for what you do. 
I'm going to jump from California to uh, Middle America and uh, ask Jim Olson uh, to tell us a little bit who he is and uh, where he's at. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're here. And uh, before I forget, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, and uh, we're so excited to have you here. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of the NTCA, and um, I'm kind of in charge of these webinars. So I've been really happy to work with uh, Sarah and Paul and their staff, and of course, our staff. And, uh, and now we have the experts on, and I'm really excited to see some information coming and uh, answer some questions for you. So last thing I'll say is please put uh, type your question in on the chat screen and uh, we'll make sure we address those the best we can. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Jim. Uh, appreciate all you do with these webinars and guiding us along and moving south from Minnesota to Mississippi. Uh, Bart Bettega, NTCA's Executive Director. Bart? Thanks, Mark. It's uh, about uh, 70 degrees here in Mississippi today, so we're enjoying some very nice uh, December weather. I'd like to wish everybody happy holidays. I'm the executive director, as Mark said, of the NTCA. Um, you know, this is today, I, I think, um, Mark, uh, as our training director, will, will guide good discussion, and we are just fortunate to have representatives from OSHA with us. NTCA has been involved with creating uh, awareness uh, of the respirable silica rule since it came out a few years back. And uh, uh, we actually had representatives from OSHA at a Total Solutions Plus conference a couple of years ago. Um, we've been very, very fortunate to, uh, to get support from them to uh, create awareness uh, so that we can help educate and train. And so I've been happy to be a part of helping bring that information uh, to our members. So glad to have them and, and I, let's get to the program. Bart, thank you very much for that and for your leadership moving out to the East Coast now in New Jersey. And I am really uh, grateful to Brian Crane, OSHA Compliance Officer and OSHA Compliance Enforcement Officer, and to Robert Coleman, an OSHA Compliance Assistant Specialist. Uh, Brian, let's start with you and have you introduce yourself to us and tell us uh, about who you are. Thanks for being here, Brian. I, I really appreciate the invite. Um, I've been with OSHA for 10 years. Uh, I, I came from a, another career. Uh, it's something that do primarily construction. I am out there. I, I've seen what these things and, and, you know, I remember 30 years back on my previous career, seeing the big cloud of dust and, and workers working in it and me driving through it and not thinking anything of it. And, you know, now the education, uh, that most of us have received regarding respirable silica and knowing what it can do. You know, just my mantra is that, that you don't want to be that 60 year old grandparent that's out there trying to chase their grandkids around the backyard and, and all of a sudden have the, these respirable uh, diseases coming upon you and, you know, the silicosis and COPD and the things that can be brought on by, by silica. So just as much education as we can get out and, that's, I'm actually not an enforcement officer at this time. I, I am also a compliance assistant specialist, just like Rob. But I'll turn it over to Rob. He's got a little more time with the organization. Hey, than I do. Rob gets on here, Brian. I just want to thank you and uh, all of those East Coast states for taking all of the snow so far this year. <laughs> here in Minnesota, we don't have any, and it's 40 degrees here. So thank you. I appreciate it. Still real early. <laughs> Too early. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Brian. Rob, uh, how about you? Thank you for being here and joining us. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, uh, like Brian said, I, I work with Brian. I'm a compliance assistant specialist. I've been with OSHA um, almost 16 years. Um, for the last two years, I've been doing this job where we get to do, uh, you know, like the title says, compliance assistance. We get to show up and help employers. Um, prior to that, I was uh, in enforcement doing mostly construction-related inspections. Um, you know, the guy that you didn't want showing up at your job site. But um, these last couple of years are great. They kind of allow us to work with a lot of associations and employers. And um, it's nice when people actually like you showing up at their job site and like to uh, get a phone call from you now as opposed to in the past. So it's good. Well, you don't look that mean to me. <laughs> I try not. <laughs> All right. Well, we are really glad that we have you here to, to help us today. Brian and I spent some time on the phone the other day, and I think we have a lot discuss. 
And I want to get started with everybody uh, to talk about what is silica? What is this stuff that we're talking about, really? And I want to ask that of Paul. Paul, I know that you really know how to describe to our attendees uh, in, in very easy terms what silica and this respirable part of it is. Well, the silica is the basically the dust that is, uh, or material that's in most of the uh, concrete products that you find around the world. It's, it's actually one of the most common elements uh, in uh, that we have here on Earth. Um, and so, of course, it gets into building products. Um, whenever you start to take, uh, basically, it's rocks, it's granite, it's anything made of silica. And whenever you start cutting that, and making it uh, into very small particles, it floats in the air. And, and it, it, it really, when you cut it or break it or grind it, it is, generates a, a very small crystalline silica, which is kind of a jagged piece of glass, if you will. And that jagged piece of glass floats around in the air. That's that dust cloud. Um, and people breathe that in. And of course they breathe it in. That jagged little piece of silica gets stuck embedded in your lungs creates a little bit of scar tissue that you just, you know, lost that little piece of uh, lung capacity there. So, so uh, like Brian was saying, you know, we all saw it in years past and didn't think anything about it. We thought we'd just cough that stuff up, but as uh, we've learned, that's not the case. And it just is uh, breathing it in. And we, you know, the more you breathe in, the less lung capacity you have. And that's the serious message. Like Brian was saying, you don't want to be a 60 year old man or even younger and, not have you know lung capacity or breath to run around the backyard with your kids or grandkids so so in a, in a nutshell and like i said it's silica is found in in tile it's found in concrete products i mean most building products use some sort of silica because it's a very a useful you know, product to make you know, products in concrete out of so uh, that's what it is in a nutshell so it's in our setting materials, it's in our tile, it's in, it's in the pieces that we're putting together um, every day in the tile industry. And when we cut it, it gets in the air and we suck it in and it doesn't come out and it hurts us. Well, Brian, why does the government regulate this thing? And a regulation sounds like this big, mean, heavy overlord sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> why is the government forcing this down our necks? Well, you hate to, to think of it this way, but basically for our own protection. I mean, for especially those of you in the trades that, you know, it's it's been, it, it's kind of makes sense. They put it under our, our hazardous substances portion of the standard in the construction standard. That 1153 comes under uh, a wide variety of hazardous substances. It's been deemed a hazardous substance when it, when it is respirable and gets into your lungs. And, you know, one of the things about, the, the stuff that, that your industry works with, a lot of it's natural stuff, but boy, whenever you're putting man-made materials together, uh, you know, mixing things, it's just loaded with silica. So, you know, it's it just rampant a, a, a amongst your industry. So if I'm on a nice white beach in Florida or something and I'm running around on the sand and I'm kicking up sand, which is silica, right? And I, I'm really not breathing that in. But in the industry, when it's compacted and ground up and it starts floating in the air, that's when it gets bad, right? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's a great analogy. Okay. So um, the regulation isn't really being forced down our throats as just more government oversight of a contractor. It's all about our health. Like I've heard already several times, uh, we want to age well, we want to be able to work at our jobs, and we want to spend life uh, happy and healthy. And that's the best approach to take care of ourselves. And, and that's what this is all about, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, Robert, you've been on the enforcement trail, you said. Who actually gets regulated? Who do you look at as an OSHA inspector? Who, who has to be concerned about you or in your former position walking in the door and checking us out? Sure. So, I mean, OSHA kind of covers every industry um, from manufacturing to construction. Um, you know, so some of the different things we'd find this in is in, um, you know, whether it be a, a facility that manufactures countertops, uh, like grand countertops, or 
in construction. I mean, it could be anybody from landscape contractors to tile workers to, you know, guys saw cutting in the roadway. It's kind of everywhere. Okay. So what if I'm just a, a, a commercial contractor and I've got all these safety programs in place? Um, obviously I've got, I know about this program and I'm, I'm good to go. Right. So a, a commercial contractor would be looked at and uh, you would come in and take a look at their job sites. Correct. Yeah. If we had a reason we would, that's, that's when we would fall into it. But the way it works is federal OSHA covers any private sector employer across the country. So the minute you hire a single worker, then all, all the, uh, all the aspects of that regulation would fall into place. Okay, uh, Brian, is this what you and I were talking about the other day? Uh, very, very similar, yeah. Uh, we, we would cover, I mean, the vast majority of your contractors out there, whether they're doing an R&R &R of somebody's kitchen floor or doing an entire hotel of, of terrazzo and tile floors, they come under our construction standards. And uh, there are a couple ways that, that we could get on your job sites. OSHA doesn't just drive around and say, oh, there's a job site we're inspecting. We need, we need reason. Uh, one of the reasons that I've done most of my silica inspections are driving down the road and see the big dust cloud from whether it's grinding block or, or doing, uh, doing tuck pointing, some of those activities outdoors. But let's face it, in your industry, a, a vast majority of your cutting is done outside, whether you're just at a residence and you know the guy's equipment's out back and, and they're making their cuts out back. And if it's with the proper tools and water and they're keeping the dust down, it's not a problem. But if there's a huge dust, big dust cloud, OSHA drives by, they see that, that gives them probable cause to, to stop and initiate an inspection. The other ways that we might uh, show up on a job site, uh, it could be a worker complaint. You know, those workers that, you know, some realize that they're breathing in this stuff all day long, uh, the controls may not be there. They have the right to, to put a complaint in. They, they don't have to go directly to their boss. They can go directly to OSHA, but they can make a complaint. Um, a friend or family member of that worker can also make a complaint. Uh, the other, the third party is, is the public, uh, the private citizen, whether it's a homeowner that doesn't like their house getting all dusty from, from the silica that's being cut, or uh, we see it in business where you've got rented spaces and uh, one person, one uh, company occupying another space in the building uh, feels like they're being exposed to something because of something going on in another space. So, you know, those types of complaints can bring us to a job site also. But OSHA doesn't just go out and we can't show up at every job site, but having that on-site probable cause, complaints or referrals, uh, that's how we generally get to job sites. Mark, can I ask a quick question uh, uh, to follow up on that for Brian or Robert? Uh, that was actually a, very much a learning experience for me on how you uh, uh, determined to go out and look at, at the jobs. You mentioned that you do obviously work with all the trades. So if you go to a job off of a complaint or for a reason other than the tile industry, do you often then, since you're there, check everything out? And would then the tile uh, inspection be called, uh, you know, called in because you're say looking at a concrete contractor or another contractor because of a, a complaint, if you will? Uh, we would generally need some type of reason to expand that inspection. Uh, it's not automatically a full inspection, but if, if there are other processes going on that could create potential hazards, we do have that authority to, to expand that inspection. Rob, uh, you know, there's also another thing called a multi-employer job site. And I know, you know, if Rob would, would like to touch on that a little bit, that would, that would help me out a little bit. Sure. Yeah, no, that happens, um, especially at a construction site. I mean, you have somebody who's the general contractor that's running the job, and then you have multiple subcontractors that are there doing uh, various tasks. Um, you know, we may show up, for instance, because the roofer is up on the roof and he's not tied off. Um, but as we're walking through, we see a serious hazard where guys are, are dry cutting and there's a cloud of dust everywhere and they're exposed to a serious hazard. Um, you know, generally, you know, depending on the type of inspection, that could potentially open up to uh, expand to that as well. Um, the other thing that applies to that, too, is the general contractor if they're in control of that work site and they're on site like they should doing their frequent and regular inspections like they're required to, and they're aware of it and they're not taking any steps, 
they could pot potentially open themselves up to an inspe uh, inspection with a citation as well for any apparent hazards that, you know, are, that they're aware of. I have a quick question for you guys from social media. Are there different regulations per the size of the company? So would the regulation be any different for, you know, a one guy or two guys shop versus, you know, a tile company that has, you know, 14 different crews out there? Sure. There's no difference in the actual regulation. Um, you know, if, if the inspection rose and there was a citation that was issued, OSHA does have reduction factors in the citations that would potentially come out of it based on the size of the employer. Um, you know, somebody with a handful of employees isn't going to necessarily receive a citation that say somebody that had 50 or 100 would. They do have size reduction factors in there for that, but not as opposed, not specific to the actual regulation. And I hear you say a couple of minutes ago, Robert, that even if you had one employee, like maybe a sole proprietor and one employee would qualify? Um, the sole proprietor thing is, is kind of a whole different can of worms that comes up. And, you know, especially in construction, we run into that a lot is, is he, is he a true employee or is he a true, uh, you know, subcontractor that you have working for you? That's a whole nother, um, ABC test that we would have to uh, run through to determine whether they're actually an employee or they're just being paid cash off to the side. But that, that whole sole proprietor issue, um, if, if Brian Crane opens a business and I go out and I do kitchens, I do tile kitchens and I got a small shop, I can do them all by myself. I'm a sole proprietor. I may not come under the jurisdiction of OSHA. As soon as I get a bigger job and I need to grab a helper and bring Rob in on, on it and I'm paying Rob to get to help me, he's my employee. I'm now under the, the umbrella of OSHA. Uh, Rob and I happen to be in a strict partnership. We don't have an LLC. We don't have a company. We're just partners going out and doing basic tile jobs and splitting the profits. Those strict partnerships also uh, may not come under the jurisdiction of OSHA. The whole thing is when you have any employees and OSHA can deem them to be employees, that's when you come under uh, our jurisdiction for, for our regulations. Okay, that's uh, thanks for making that very clear. Um, and that's with any OSHA regulation, not just airborne. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Correct. All right. Great. Um, I think that answered that, that question. I want to talk a little bit about the regulation and um, what it is and how we comply. Uh, one of the things that I know that we need is a plan. Is that one of the first things that you look for when you get to a, a, a job is the plan and somebody who knows about it? I would ask about it, that somebody would have some knowledge about it. We generally don't see a lot of plans on site to tell you the honest truth. Uh, it is a requirement of the standard. It's required to have that, that uh, written plan to, to protect uh, the, the, the employees from the hazards of silica, but the silica exposure plan, I guess it, the, the proper verbiage. Um, that's not the first thing I'm looking for to be, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the actual activities, you know, what's going on, are the activities being done a, as per what's, what's required. We'll talk about table one at, at some point, or, you know, has there been some other sampling that's been going on, but okay. plan well, we is get, a requirement. And so the plan is something that comes with the- is Rob, Rob and, and uh, Brian. I just want to ask a question that relates to earlier uh, before we get too far along, but um, we do have a question is cutting tile with a grinder and no dust extraction an issue, which the answer I'm sure is yes, right? Correct. And then a second follow up is, um, uh, is everyone on a construction site at risk of getting silicosis? I mean, in other words, I mean, is that just, is it just out there? And even if you guys out looking around, are, are, are people worried about getting silicosis on every single job site, just about? It's a hard one. <laughs> well, I, uh, my personal opinion is it, it doesn't appear as though everybody <laughs> on every job site is worried about silicosis. That, that's the honest truth. 
because we still see far too much dry cutting, uh, far too many activities that, that are, are generating high levels of dust. I mean, just getting into the, the masonry industry and just think about just dumping the bags of, uh, of uh, concrete mix into the, the mixer and, and the, the cloud that, that, that spews up out of the mixer. And you look at those bags and they're, they're high silica content material. So, you know, it just, it doesn't seem like everybody's worried about it, but everybody does have a possible exposure that there's, you know, even if you don't see that heavy, thick cloud, if there's a lot of activity going on in that, at that job site, um, you've got that potential. That's a good way of putting it. Like, Everyone like Brian that. mentioned before too, one of the reasons we might be out there is maybe one of the other trades is concerned that, you know, the contractor over there who's cutting block or who's pouring the dry bags um, is exposing them. So that could be another reason why we could get called out to the job site. Yeah, Might not just be the tile contractor. Speak to that from experience, because we, you know, we, in our business, we used a lot of the dust monitors we put on people. We did all the different tasks. And I can tell you, if you see a dust cloud, you're being overexposed. It doesn't take very long to reach your pelt. Um, sure. So to answer that question, if, if a contractor is in a, you know, let's say he's in a room or a bathroom or in an enclosed space, and he's got dust hanging in there, he's overexposed. So um, if he's got people walking through that space, or maybe it's a large area, uh, and there's he's generating dust clouds, he's exposing people. So if you see dust, you got a problem. Um, you know that's the the bottom line, and, and you need to do something about it. But it is it is important, probably though, too, to to be clear. Like if a consumer is concerned in their home to talk about prolonged exposure as well, right? I mean, a, a consumer, I kind of think of it as cigarette smoking, right? You know, it's bad for you, but you know, if somebody did it once or twice, it may, you know, and all of our chemistry is different, but you don't want to freak a homeowner out if they just happen to have dust for a couple of days. There is some communication that needs to happen here too as well, right? Yes, there is, but I can tell you if you're generating that kind of dust and putting it into the home, uh, you know, that's, uh, as a consumer, if it was happening in my home, I would be very concerned about it. Because what happens is that dust now goes in, it starts settling to different places, and now you start trying to sweep it or vacuum it or blow it off of things, and it just keeps, you know, getting stirred up. So using some sort of engineer control to capture the dust, to keep it out of the homes, keep it out of the environment, that's the number one thing people should be thinking about. Capture. Especially if you, if you think about a general residential uh, HVAC system. It's not like a commercial system that's getting fresh air from outside and then pumping the air back outside. You're just recirculating the air in the house. So all that dust is just staying in that house for whoever knows how long. We, I, I can tell you that, that we have received complaints from home, homeowners having work done uh, very often on a neighbor's property. <laughs> but, uh, you know, concerned about the dust cloud that, that is in the area. So quick question from Instagram, just to kind of go back to what we were originally saying when a OSHA comes to their job site, somebody's asking, rumor is if OSHA shows up on a job site, can I ask them to leave? Is that true or false? <laughs> um, I, I, if, and if I, if I'm not, OSHA, when they show up at a job site, uh, present credentials, we talk, we conduct an opening conference and we will generally, we, we request permission to enter. That permission can be denied. What happens at that point is, especially with uh, probable cause towards a violation where we've seen that great big dust cloud. Uh, the other thing that, that, that we talked about, Mark, when an OSHA guy shows up at the job site, generally he already has all the information, all the photos that he would need to probably cite a violation. So I've taken all my, I've gathered all my evidence from offsite. So we'll request to enter the site and, and move forward with the inspection. If denied, at that point, we, we move forward with a warrant. So we, we have a process where we can actually get a warrant uh, through the courts uh, to conduct that inspection. So they can uh, deny entry at that point, but from that point, then we move to a warrant process. So you're not doing yourself any favors if you deny the, the entry. 
harder. I, I, I can't put it that way. I mean, we just move forward with our inspection. But just, I just wanted to put it out there that, and, and Rob, if you want to talk about this, please, your experience. Yeah, especially in construction, a lot of, like, like Brian said, a lot of your work's outside. Um, you know, neighbors take pictures. During an inspection, I've taken pictures from the roadway outside the front of the job site. I mean, so anything in public view. Um, so let's talk about outside versus inside. And I know Jim asked the question and I heard Paul bring something up too. And I want to come back to engineering controls, but I'm interested in about interior versus exterior. Uh, is it obviously worse when we're making dust inside or is it equally as bad outside? Uh, it, it's, it's better outside. And I think you can see that table one does absolutely reflect that. There are some activities that uh, when using the engineering controls in table one, outside, they allow you to do the work for less than four hours without any respiratory protection. As soon as you move that inside, even if you're talking on a big 20,000 square foot, you know, tilt up concrete warehouse, you move that concrete cutting inside, even with a wet sole and all the appropriate attachments, you still need to use that, have that uh, AFP of, of 10, which is going to be a half mask, elastomeric half mask or a filtering face piece respirator. So okay. it does make a difference. Okay. So I, I heard a couple of new terms. I heard about table one. I heard something about an APF and I know there's something called a PEL, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's just talk through those a little bit. So we all understand what they are. What is what is this table one? Um, Robert, can you tell us what that is? So yeah, table one is a, uh, it's a table in the standard um, that was developed when the new standard came out and I think it was 2017 and it has a list of common tasks that are conducted um, where it could generate silica and it gives a task as well as the, um, I guess you'd call it like the administer, the engineering control that as long as you follow that task with that proper engineering control, then you sh should be okay and not overexposed and you wouldn't have to do your own self sampling. Okay, so, a so there's a whole bunch of different tasks. tasks. There's a, a yes, task each task says, you know, if you're grinding with an angle grinder, as long as you used a, a dust collection system with a HEPA filter, um, then as long as it's outside for less than four hours, then you don't need a uh, any respiratory protection. Okay. So each job, little job we do, a component of the whole tile job, cutting or scoring or whatever we're doing, grinding, that is a different task. And Correct. each of those has one of these APFs assigned. Is that right, Brian? Uh, not, an APF is an assigned protection factor uh, for respiratory protection. So uh, each type of respiratory protection has a different assigned protection factor. Um, so where you look at table one, it may tell you, uh, you know, cutting with a concrete saw. So we go into the landscaping, you've got your typical steel, uh, 12 inch blade gas powered saw. If you're doing that with uh, the proper engineering controls as per the manufacturer's specifications. So you're using uh, the water attachment with a proper water supply at the proper flow rate outside the table says you don't need any respiratory protection uh, with that same task you move that inside you need uh, some type of respiratory protection and it it has uh, APF 10 which would be a filtering face piece or a half mask respirator um, it moves up to an APF 25 I think on the list I think that's the max that, that it goes to but you can also use a full face respirator, which I believe is an APF of 50. So all the different respiratory protection have a different assigned protection factor. Okay, so all of these APFs, the larger number they get, that starts adding up into our exposure, our personal exposure, right? Is that how Well, that's works? protecting you from that exposure. That's, okay. that's a protective factor. It's not, that's not the risk factor. So the table one, it just spells out the task what's allowed to be done with each type of tool and uh, say like even a tuck pointing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, tuck pointing on the list, mortar is, is identified as having a very high silica content. Those guys outside grinding, even with a full 
vacuum HEPA filter system, they still need to wear respiratory protection. So can, can you define respiratory protection as an N9, N95 mask considered resp respiratory protection? And N95 is, go ahead, Rob, please, you, you got. No, that's okay. I was gonna, I was gonna say, yeah, an N95 is a respirator. So an N95, a half face elastomeric with the two cartridges, a full face respirator, they're all different types. So if we all just throw respirators on, we're good to go, right? Not, not really the case, yeah. but that, that gets yeah, complicated. Not so much. I, that's kind of a rhetorical question. Um, but because let's go back to engineering controls a little bit, and then we'll talk more about respirators and why they m might not be the total solution. How about that? Um, Paul, I know you know a few things about respir I mean, uh, respirators, but how about engineering controls? You've worked on some of those, right? Yeah, we've, you know, we've been using those things, uh, you know, for many years in our business as a mason and masonry contractor, you know, we had wet cutting saws. I know what, you know a few things about respir I mean, uh, respirators, but how about engineering controls? You've worked on some of those, right? We're having a glitch here. Yeah, we've, you know, we've been using those things, uh, you know, for many years in our business. Where is it coming from? Mason and masonry contractor, you know, we had wet cutting saws. Sorry, we're having a technical difficulty here. I mean, uh, okay. but how about engineering controls? All right. Well, while you guys are sorting that out, microphone for a second. Where is it coming from? Stop it. Engineering controls. Um, okay, we're back. Engineering controls are like tools that are. Uh, Brian, you started talking about those a little bit. That have some water supplied to them that um, eat up the dust, and so we don't have to breathe it. Um, is that a layman's description of what an engineering control is? Absolutely. Any, um, any type of system that eliminates that, that dust risk, that either through vacuum, through water controls, water is a very common uh, way to control it, but obviously you can't just use a water spray in every environment. Um, the important thing that all of the tasks that are in table one, to talk about the engineering controls that need to be used. They're all recognized. They all have some type of uh, quantitative or qualitative data behind them uh, that says they have the, the appropriate, when used properly, they provide the appropriate amount of protection. Um, the problem is when those engineering controls don't use, are, are not used properly. Um, when the guys out there with a the, angle grinder and it's got to just make a couple small cuts uh, to, to, to do some intricate work around the toilet or something. And he's making those small cuts and uh, we got the guy with the shop back standing next to him, just trying to suck up as much as he can uh, of that blast. There's no data on that unless that company has actually tested that process. And that's, that's one of the possible resources They they test that process. And if it doesn't come in at the, the 25 microgram uh, action level would obviously that would be below the 50 microgram Pell. That's that's the whole purpose of, of using the engineer engineering controls in that manner. Okay, so the engineering controls on a piece of equipment or a, for a task are designed to keep the dust down so it's uh, not a problem. But when we avoid it, if we want to do a different do it differently, like you described, maybe you got a, a helper holding the shop vac. All my company would have to do is some testing on it to make sure that I'm in compliance with the regulation. And then I would document that and go ahead with that process. And you as an inspector would see that as okay. If as I have done all that background that, work. As long as all that background work is done, the, the testing, the documentation, the task has to be exactly as it's being performed. Right uh, or as as close to a replication as possible. That's, and then that data is is there and saved and stored and and ready for review. So okay. Brian, does that documentation need to be on site when you're there? That I I, I I'm not sure. It it needs to be in the uh, the exposure plan. 
but I'm not sure if it's on site. Rob, do you remember if that's that must be on site? I, uh... I don't believe it needs to be on site. I mean, as long as there's not a huge cloud of dust on site, I think you, we could wait later. <laughs> I thought I thought I had read somewhere um, reading through it, and it's been a while. I'm sorry though that. Um, if you do that testing, your own testing on a certain situation, and you have that documentation, it would need to be on site if, let's say, Rob was there to uh, uh, question or, or review that process. So maybe I'm wrong, or, or it's been adjusted since I read it. Well, it may just we be the wording. That. I think the wording may be made available to inspectors. Some, maybe the wording too. may be something like that. So. Yeah. You know, that could be interpreted as, as on site or it could be interpreted as, you know, I'm conducting an inspection, get me the data, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, not the first time I interpreted something wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. it's wrong. I, I, I think that's a reasonable interpretation. Yeah. The I other to... thing that I, I do need to say, and I know we're right in the yeah. middle, um, Rob and I, uh, and it's in the form of a dis disclaimer, Rob and I are giving the information as to the best of our knowledge and the best of our research in the standard, uh, what we have in front of us and, and what we're talking about. Nothing that we say implies any rule of law or, or creates any new or different obligations. The standard is what it is, and we're doing the best we can to interpret uh, that standard. We appreciate that. We, we understand. Jim, I had that same uh, perception that you did. And I think uh, what I understand on that plan, exposure control plan, that could be something that's back at the office. And you can talk about the person who's super smart about that plan. But when you're on the job, you're going to look for the job foreman, the most senior person on the job and ask them what's going on, right? That's so I, there was a quick question, um, both on chat on Zoom and on Instagram. If you wanted to read that one real quick, Jim. I believe they were asking about, um, I think Rob had one and there was another one. Do you see those? Uh, what, how did it start off? I didn't see it, no. There was one that said, um, asking about if there was a document for testing, oh. if they could get access to that. And I believe the NTCA does have something like that. Sure, so, so um, I'm sorry that was, I didn't have it from Rob. So do you have any educational, the question was, do you have any educational documents um, that could be distributed to uh, their company uh, really on, on this information? And, and uh, NTCA does have a, a, a whole section on COVID, uh, excuse me, on uh, silica, silicosis. And uh, Bart, where is, that, where is that located? Do you remember? It's on our... Uh... Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Position statements library. Right. Okay. And on and, our homepage. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess the best way to put this is we, you know, we have interpretation based upon how we, uh, how we uh, look at it from a tile industry perspective. And then we recommend that everybody goes to get this information related to the rule itself to stay current is to go to the OSHA website to get the information on the rule and the table. And that's the best way I could put it, Jim and Mark, is that, you know, you know, we've got, we want to simplify the rule for the tile guys and we've got information there. And I think there were some other questions on chat, Jim, related to that about the tile industry versus the concrete industry. But yeah, that'd be the best way, Mark, is go to the OSHA site for, inter for the information on the OSHA ruling and table one. If you want to come to our trainers or come to our department related to like the tile, the tools, the stuff that Paul has with IQ, that's where we come in as a, as a tile association. Yeah, I, th I think it's important to also note, we've been talking about uh, a particular task, if you can get an exemption or, or qualified, it's important to understand what that means to test that and document it, just like Brian and, and Robert were talking about, because what that means is you, uh, hired, uh, an, <clears throat> excuse me, either an industrial hygienist or somebody that can help you. These are air monitoring pumps. Um, and this uh, takes in a certain amount of air, which replicates your breathing zone. And there's a cartridge right here. This is a little cartridge. So you would take a sampling of that when the person is doing that task, take a sample of the dust in that environment, take this cartridge now that is, uh, you know, associated with a certain amount of minutes 
uh, and then you send that off to a lab, the lab will give you those test results to tell you what percentage of silica and are you at a, a point where that's an acceptable task or are you at some point where you have to take action. So, so it's not just, you know, you can't do a test and say, yeah, it's good. I mean, there's actually document, you gotta send these out to the lab, prove it. And then when you have that information, then that becomes part of your, your written uh, silica exposure, you know, plan. And then, yeah, you know, uh, you know, the best is to keep that documentation on the job site if possible with your competent person. I mean, that's really the best thing, but I, I think these guys would, uh, you know, allow you, if you had it at the office, they'll give you the chance to produce it. So, uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it, it is quite involved and there's several steps to, you know, get compliant, but, uh, uh, especially as you become larger contractors, you have to take those steps to protect your employees. And there are requirements for that initial testing and then follow up also. So, that, you know, it, it's not just one and done. That if you're going to continue doing that process the same way, you've got to continue to, to, to retest. If I'm not mistaken in the standard, it says it at a minimum every three years of that same type task. And you're going to need to get more of an, a sample than just you know, Brian Crane doing it. If you got a 20 man crew, you're going to have to do more than just one guy. So quite wanna, labor wanna intensive. Quickly, um, address the uh, uh, documents though. So um, NTCA has a, uh, on our website, a magazine and publications uh, part. And in there, there's position statement library. And if you scroll down, we do have a lot of what we're talking about today is outlined and simply read. And it's in, it's just under silica exposure control plan. There's lots of plans, there's a, uh, an overview and there's a compliance guideline and a checklist and a written exposure plan. There's a lot of things for you to look at that are simply identified, please go there. And we did just get from uh, Jerry Painter, he's a MCAA instructor for the uh, Train the Trainer seminars. And uh, he says they also have sample um, action plans and waivers available for anyone looking, so. Hey, Jim, the other thing I wanted to add too that's available, um, especially to a lot of the smaller contractors out there, is um, a lot of uh, states operate their own OSHA state plan. So like here in New Jersey, federal OSHA does uh, enforcement over private sector employees. Um, the state has an OSHA agency that does enforcement for public sector employees, but they get all this grant money. And part of the caveat to that is that they have to do free consultation to small employers, private sector uh, small employers. So if you were a small contractor here in New Jersey, you could call up the state OSHA consultation service and for free, they'll help you develop an exposure program. Um, I've even heard they'll come out and do some free sampling for you or even do training for your workers. So that depending on what state you're in, that's another really good resource that uh, is that's already covered. Fabulous. That's fabulous. That's great, Robert. Great to know. Um, Every yeah. state has a free program. And, and when you talk state. about small, um, that you could have a hundred employees. It's not, you know. Yeah, I think that, your definition is like 250 for a small employer. Yeah. So you right. know, most, of, most of your contractors would, would be able to, and they're on-site consultation visits and they'll point out hazards and they'll let the guys know what they need to do. Um, they're totally insulated from enforcement and uh, it, it's a good deal. That actually is uh, fantastic news. And that's some information maybe we need to get on our website too and out to our members for sure. Um, a, a free plan consultation. That's excellent, excellent news. Before I forget, I missed this back a ways and you can answer this quickly. It had to do with uh, cutting concrete, grinding concrete or grain, grinding tile. And um, this person is, is wanting to know, is it less hazardous to grind tile than concrete? Actually, no. Uh, I, I will say that uh, you know, I had these questions myself and, and they're all silica containing, but someone had told me that, that one of the highest silica content materials that you folks might use is a porcelain tile. And, you know, so even those smaller tiles can have a, a higher concentration of silica and be just as hazardous. That, so, so tile, um, you know, different silica contents and different materials uh, will create a different reading, but they're all silica containing and, and, and people need to be protected. So the tools we use then to cut tile are very critical uh, to make sure that we're meeting those engineering re control requirements of table one, or we have the documentation on hand uh, 
And manufacturers, I think like uh, Paul's company could help us understand that, help individual contractors understand the tools they're using to make sure they're safe. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that people need to understand also that engineering controls um, have their limitations as well. For example, wet cutting, what you move that inside, that still is, while it's knocking down the dust, there's still dust in the air. It's just more of a mist. So, you know, those, those things have to be uh, thought about as well. Just because you're wet cutting doesn't mean there's no, no hazard, especially indoors. Um, and from a manufacturer standpoint, and you can look at table one, but, uh, you know, we, for example, we have our white paper on all of our tools. So you can look at the testing and go to the particular tool, find the test results and make sure, uh, you know, what you're allowed to do with that tool. And some of the tools have limitations. Maybe they say you can only cut, you know, so X amount of uh, feet for four hours a day or you know, six hours a day, because that gets you to your PEL, which is your permissible exposure limit, uh, and keeps you, you know, that person safe for that for that day for that eight hour period. So, okay, so there's your uh, table one tools, and then the tools where you have that manufacturer data that can be placed in your exposure control plan for the tasks you're doing. Um, on the job. That's how all this starts coming together. Yeah. And as a manufacturer, IQ Power Tools, we've actually been working with OSHA and Table One to get our engineer controls recognized, but it, it's quite an involved process. Uh, we submitted all that stuff and we're working with them. So um, because it is a, another alternative um, to w a wet cutting and, and contractors need, you know, every tool and every alternative they can do just to keep their their people safe. And one of the things that isn't on table one um, is holding a sponge next to a blade on a grinder. Um, <laughs> and I know that's a very common practice. And, and I just kind of want to say that publicly that that's not on table one because it's not a controlled uh, a flow of water onto the blade. Am I understanding that right, Robert or Brian? Yeah, that there's nothing that that talks about that. Again, if if a company wanted to do their, you know, quantitative and qualitative analysis and do all the testing and and keep their data, but generally, you know, we we see that type of uh, move. Uh, I see the uh, the five gallon bucket of water with the uh, wallpaper paste brush outside on the large saws and the guys. Uh, Licking the water onto the blade. I, I see uh, my insectic, my lawn insecticide sprayer, the little three to five gallon insecticide sprayer, full of water, uh, with the stream on the blade. Uh, those aren't tested methods, and, and that would be well outside uh, what Table One, you know, unless there's that objective data that says that somebody has tested that and that, and that that's usually much more costly than than is worth it for a small company like that. Okay. And like Paul said, um, some of that dust that might be coming in the airborne, waterborne droplets could come down, dry out, and you still have that silica that you're brushing off, you know, and creating dust the second time. Um, Jim, hey, can I just make a reminder to everybody that's uh, in attendance? Please remember this within a couple days after this uh, presentation is over, it will be on YouTube. All right, it'll be on the NTCA channel and the IQ Power Tool channel. You can view it and share it as many times as you want. Thanks, Jim. Getting back to those respirators then, you know, different kinds of tools, uh, different table one things. Why don't we just slap a respirator on our face, an N95 uh, or a higher rated respirator? Seems like a simple solution. I, I know it isn't. It's a very complicated solution. Um, Robert O'Brien, could you tell us a little bit why that is not just an easy way to go? Unfortunately, unfortunately, that seems to be the thought out there. I'll throw a, a dust mask on, I'll throw a filtering face piece on, I'll throw a half mask on and I'll be fine. Um, without that data of knowing exactly what that employee is exposed to, but just the, the wearing of the respirator to protect themselves from that hazard brings about a full respiratory protection program. Uh, training, fit testing, uh, and without just, very often the biggest problem is fit testing. Uh, 
here, have a couple dust masks, go out, break up the concrete, cut the tile, do whatever you need to do, not knowing if those dust masks are properly fitted and, and will protect those workers. So between fit testing, medical evaluations, a full respiratory protection program, uh, annual reviews, annual fit testing, that, that brings about a whole nother realm of OSHA and, and regulatory standards. So yeah, the, mine and people with facial hair and people that smoke, you know, probably don't qualify for those types of things. So, I mean, it really you start adding up those factors because this was one of the things as us as a contractor, we really strive to put our respiratory protection program in place that said, we're just going to make everybody wear respirators. And when we tried to implement that, we found it's, it's nearly impossible. It could be effective, but people have facial hair, people smoke. You, and you can't just have clean shaven non-smokers to do that task because they can wear a respirator. I mean, it just, that's not the real world we live in. So that was one of our big challenges that really pushed us a long time ago to find engineering controls, so. So just wearing the act of wearing that respirator, one that fits correctly is sort of cumbersome and you got, got to work a little harder to breathe a little harder and you might not be healthy enough to wear it. So the doctor has to check your lung capacity and your heart capacity and make sure you're safe that way. We don't want to add that other problem and that's why that occupational program is needed. Does an N95 mask need to be fitted? Yes. Yeah, an N95 is considered a uh, tight fitting respirator that they make different sizes so they have to be fit tested um, to fit people's faces. Um, OSHA kind of, you know, follows it like Control. So if you can engineer the hazard out or eliminate it completely, um, it's a lot better than having to worry about, you know, geez, is my employee going to wear it properly? Is he going to wear it at all? Is he going to put it on upside down? You know, so that's uh, PBE generally has a whole nother set of issues um, that you have to worry about. So if you could not engineer it out ahead of time, not have to worry about it, then that's the best way to go. How often do you recommend, Robert, that um, you check up on your safety procedures, your respiratory procedures to make sure everything's working? I think if, so if you have a respiratory protection program, I think it just needs to be um, evaluated annually, I believe. You know, it doesn't mean you have to redo it, but just double check and make sure it's uh, appropriate. Um, as far as the fit testing goes, if you're going to have an employee wear a uh, tight fitting respirator, that has to be done annually. How about uh, just your exposure control plan and your general uh, on-site practices? You want to do a daily check, or yeah. So, so our, our constrictions, our, I'm sorry, our, our construction standard does have a segment in there about um, you know generic safety programs and worksite inspections, um, and it does talk about you know performing frequent and regular inspections of the job site by a competent person who, um, you know, that's. Uh, through all my years of construction inspections, that was always the biggest. Well, I just went to get lunch and came back and now you're here and all 10 guys are working on the roof without fall protection or, you know, they've been, you know, there's a huge pile of dust and, you know, I don't know. I, so, um, yeah, the, we do have a standard that does say that you, you have to provide frequent, frequent and regular inspections of the job site. Okay. You can't just sit there and pray that they follow the rules. <laughs> and that competent person requirement is listed in, in the uh, uh, silica standard. There has to be somebody that, that has that re uh, requisite knowledge to be able to conduct those inspections and identify those hazards. Uh, a big thing about a competent person, when people talk about competent people, they have to be able to take the action also. If you got a, a foreman out on the job site that's really knowledgeable, knows, knows the hazards and uh, all of a sudden something happens, but he's got to call the superintendent or he's got to call the company owner to find out if he's allowed to give out respirators or do something different with the water hookup or, or fix whatever's wrong. He's really not a competent person uh, by our standard. They have to have that ability to, to make those changes when needed. Robert, Robert or Brian, some of our larger tile contracting companies that have been involved on large scale projects have utilize the services of uh, independent third party uh, uh, compliance testers or, or, or consultants. Um, have you seen that out there? And what's the process uh, 
with you, uh, has, is that an effective practice? Would, you, would that be something you would recommend for, for them to be compliant? Because you could, you could do a task on one job but not, and be compliant, but maybe to another job, not be compliant. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. If, if I could, and I, uh, I had a little experience uh, up in some of the New York City inspections and uh, their Department of Buildings for a certain size project has a requirement that uh, companies hire outside contracted safety firms. And uh, the problem is generally that safety person isn't on the job site all the time. And generally all the people that work there know when the safety person's on the job site. Uh, I, I say it's a, it could be a valuable resource, a different set of eyes on a job, but to have that uh, qualified, uh, educated either by experience, you know, the, the, the person that really knows your job on that job every day, all day long with that set of eyes, that good foreman, I, I think that's your biggest resource for safety, empowering everybody down the chain to do the right thing for safety. So I have a two part question. First part is how would somebody become a competent person? And then the follow up, depending on this, I guess, do you have to have a competent person per size of job? Like if you had 50 employees, you need two competent people or is it just one person regardless of the size of the job? There isn't anything in the standard that, that really drills down into it that much. Um, there are different companies out there that are happy to give you a training block and say, you're now a competent person. But if that training isn't in your specific field, um, generally a competent person gets the, the training and experience they need on the job site from doing the job. Got you know, it. it's that, that experienced tile contractor, that experienced foreman that's been doing the job, maybe had some education in the standards. That is one of the things that you have to be aware of the, the OSHA standards that are applicable to your job. So, you know, you could be a great tile setter, but, uh, you know, if you don't know what the OSHA regulations are, whether it's respiratory protection or, or the silica realm or HASCOM, uh, you, you might not fit into that competent person uh, slot. So it does take a little bit of education, but generally we see those experienced personnel out there that, that have that job experience. Rob, did, is there anything I missed on that? No, no, I think that's that's... That was good. I mean, you know, we don't have anything that says, you know, there's no certification to become a competent person. It's generally based off your years of uh, your knowledge and experience. So, But it, it would be good advice for our members, right? That if you're going to designate someone a competent person, that you make sure that they're educated and trained. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because, you know, sometimes you show up at a, at a work site and you ask, I don't know if I misphrased the question wrong, but you're like, okay, you know, who's your competent person? They're like, well, are you saying I'm not competent? It's, it's not, you know, it's not like a an insult or anything like that. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, who's, who's the guy with the most years of experience here that should really know what's going on. Yeah. And are you knowledgeable about this ruling and, and compliance, right? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And really understanding the hazard. That's where it comes down to that that competent person understands the hazard and has the ability to change the circumstances to protect people. Okay, here might be a dumb question, but are for the other regulations on a job site, do those regulations have a competent person? So would that competent silica person have to be responsible for other job safety stuff? It's absolutely possible. Like Rob referred to, uh, one part of our standard says that uh, as part of our programs area, in construction, there needs to be a competent person that conducts frequent and regular inspections of the job site, job materials uh, for safety purposes. So it, it's, that's just general and overall. Uh, there are competent person requirements for scaffolding and a couple other specific areas, uh, excavations, but there's that general requirement. And then some standards like respirable silica, scaffolding and excavations have a specific requirement for competent persons. That you could have a job site with an excavation, uh, silico on the job site, and a scaffold, and it could be the same competent person as long as they have that knowledge in all those areas. Got it. Cool. Thank you. And Brian, you kind of gave me a great analogy um, where some work might be done on an existing large job site, and the owner of that job site knew that work was going on, and they hired 
a, a general contractor and that there were several subcontractors and that was sort of a shared responsibility or even some equal responsibility, right? A absolutely. That gets into the, the multi-employer job site that, that Rob was uh, talking about earlier, that um, being on that job site, uh, you can be held, OSHA can see you as an employer uh, as far as responsibility in, in several different ways, whether you're that tile company that's cutting and creating the dust and exposing your employees and your, your, your direct exposure. You could be an exposing uh, employer where you could be held responsible for exposing the carpenters to your silica dust. So be aware that you could have all your employees in full protection You've uh, done your testing. They're in all full face respirators, uh, for, uh, clean air uh, supplied respirators, and you're out there generating silica dust and another trade is out there and you're exposing them. That exposure you could be held accountable for. Um, a GC or, or the general contractor on the job site that has knowledge of the work that you're doing, uh, they can be seen as a controlling contractor and they can also be cited uh, along those same lines. And generally when OSHA uses that multi-employer uh, edict, uh, it's not like we're excluding one employer. We're just including everybody that has a responsibility. So uh, generally it, it's multiple companies that end up receiving citations on the job site in situations like that. Hey, on that note before, I know we're running late, Mark, are you guys having in the last 10 months, when you're out on jobs, are you also looking for any COVID compliance or social distancing or any kind of violations related to COVID or are you not involved in that at all? That's part of uh, our mission to get as much information and, and create job sites that are safe for COVID. Uh, but we're looking in specific areas, a, a lot in healthcare. We put out a lot of information in the construction industry uh, the thing with social distancing and uh, OSHA doesn't see uh, face coverings as PPE. Um, there's a lot of information that came out of CDC, but right now it, uh, we're using existing standards to enforce COVID stuff. We're putting out information for best practices, but to say OSHA is going to go on a job site and we're going to write a citation for social distancing right now. Uh, except in certain environments. I mean, I'm sure that uh, they're looking at it in meatpacking industries and stuff like that, where, where it's generally a, a completely different type environment. Sure. So we're looking at it, but uh, you know, in, enforcement is definitely possible. We can use the general duty clause if we can show that that's creating a hazard. Wow, terrific. There's also been a lot of state executive orders. So that kind of this, Regulations have kind of varied state by state as far as that. And here at Federal OSHA, we're across the country. So it's tough, you know, like here in New Jersey, we have, you know, the state has executive orders for face coverings and gatherings and social distancing and stuff like that. And then you may go to another state and, and that's not the case. So, yeah, and that's a good reminder. And this is a national, uh, you guys are a national uh, association, uh, different states. Uh, Oregon has their own OSHA. They do private sector, public sector, and promulgate their own rules. Cal OSHA is the same way. I think uh, Michigan might be the same way. There are numerous states that have their own OSHA, and, and those states have certainly put in uh, those types of social distancing regulations and, and stuff that they are out in enforcing. So federal OSHA, from our standpoint, we can use the general duty clause, but there are other states out there that have very specific uh, COVID related standards that they promulgated. Outstanding information. Uh, Sarah or Jim, are there any other questions uh, we should address for our attendees? Yep, I got one on Facebook from Tom. He asked if a product has been tested and has proven to pro provide non-detectable exposure to a task that is otherwise dangerous and at a time limited task listed on table one, how does that affect an inspector's review of the job site or employer's overall plan? That's part of our hierarchy of controls. The first part of that hierarchy is removing the hazard. If you're using a product that is silica free or proven to not generate that respirable silica, that
that's the, the best possible means to, you know, we, we want to go remove that actual hazard, then move to the engineering controls, then admin controls. So that's the best possible thing that can be done. Find a product that does not create the hazard. Perfect. That's, uh, that's our last Did question. I get that right, Rob? No, it's good. <laughs> hey guys, I just want to tell you that uh, I have no more questions and we don't have any, any questions on our chat screen, but you guys were great. I learned a lot today, even though I think I've been up on the, the whole program and, and OSHA and the silica, silicosis situation. Um, this was great. It was fantastic. And yeah, a lot of new information. Thank you. I, if I could, I just want to want to throw out there again, Rob mentioned the consultation. Look it up in your state, uh, OSHA free consultation. There, there's an office in every state, whether it's done through the state plan, whether it's done through a university. Also, do not be fearful of calling your local OSHA office. If you've got a question, if you're Brian Crane's tile installer and you really want to make your job safer, you can call. You don't have to say, hey, this is Brian Crane uh, tile installer from 123 Main Street. I'm going to be working down on uh, East Fifth Avenue uh, tomorrow. Uh, can you tell me how I can do this? You can be anonymous, ask a question. We've got people out there that love to be the helpful arm where we're not writing citations. Uh, the area offices love those questions. If, if the person on the phone doesn't have the answer, they'll find somebody that could research the answer. Use OSHA as a sounding board. Use OSHA as a, as a help. That was the number one piece of information that I enjoyed hearing today. I will say the free services and the yeah. ability to ask questions because people are confused. I think it was, I think that was great. Yeah, Rick, uh, you can even find your local compliance assistance specialist. There's a tab for compliance assistance specialist on the website, and you can click by state, and it'll give you your the local one, the closest one assigned to the closest area office. Getting better all the I time. Tried to, I tried to right. do that. I didn't even plug uh, our own. Uh, our CSP uh, programs. That's that's where Rob and I work. That's who you would be referred to, guys like us. I didn't even plug ourselves, Rob. Perfect. Well, you guys really are nice guys, and uh, you're you're not the big mean uh, people that um, we might think you are. And um, really, the government is is not just trying to uh, shove more regulations on us. It's for our own good, and uh, you're really helping us understand this a lot. And thank you. Uh, for the tremendous amount of information and for your time and uh, coming and helping us out today. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the invite. Uh, thank you guys. This was really great. And we still have a lot of questions that I think we'll put together and probably call you guys another time to answer those questions. So yeah. okay. sounds good. We appreciate you guys a yeah. lot. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank right. you for, Thanks. for joining us. And we have part one available on YouTube which focused all about the health hazards um, and what's with the American Lung Association. So you can get access to that. And then like everybody shared before, this will also be on YouTube in the next few days. So we'll have part one and part two. So, and if you guys ever have questions, welcome to email us and we will get those answers for you. Yep. So thank you, everybody. Everybody be Happy safe. Holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.